So I guess I'll start with Abele, if that's okay. Um, I'm more familiar with this. I write often about Facebook, but for those who are less familiar, can you just talk about essentially why you're here? Some are more familiar, some are less, but what are some of the use cases of Facebook data in global health, international development, humanitarian response outcomes? Sure, I think it's important to say that Facebook starts from a position of humility. Hmm. Um, we are not experts when it comes to development. Um, and so one of the key principles is that we partner. So to the extent to which we can partner with you who are experts mm -hmm. to amplify the work that you are doing, um, that's, our po that's our point of view. Um, the other thing is we also come from a position of sort of curiosity and discovery. So essentially, are there ways that people are already using, our communities are already using our platforms? Mm -hmm. And is there a way we can amplify those use cases already? So I just want to set that, sort of like level set that. Um, and, the, and then also to say that we're at the very beginning. So again, we're not experts, mm -hmm. but we're at the very beginning of sort of identifying these are ways that people are using our platforms and these are ways that our platforms can be used even more powerfully um, to drive positive outcomes across the world. Um, so I'll talk about a couple of use cases. Um, so one, we know that social media um, is increasingly ingrained in people's everyday lives. So even in places where you have lowered connectivity, or as, as compared to the US or as compared to the to EU, people are increasingly turning to Facebook, people are increasingly turning to WhatsApp to communicate. We also know that in moments of crisis, that people turn to social media to let their friends and family know that they're okay, to, to reach out for help. And so we noticed this activity. So the first time we noticed it was about tw um, 2011, um, Tokyo where there was an earthquake and so we the, the engineers in Japan noticed that people were going onto Facebook saying hey I'm okay or hey I need help and so that group sort of decided hey can we put hack something together so that there's an organized way that people can sort of let people know that they're okay so that was sort of the first prototype um, and then um, later on during the Boston Marathon bombings um, there was a hackathon sort of um, that came off of the back of that to figure out one coherent platform that people could do that um, so since then it's been deployed multiple times um, essentially, so it's become sort of a suite of crisis response tools. But again, that goes back to identifying ways people were using the platforms and seeing if we could build tools to amplify them. Um, so in uh, 2014, we've had the first safety check. So it's called safety check, it was, uh, we, which we deployed in the Philippines. Um, and in the beginning, it was something that Facebook deployed um, ourselves. But this goes back to the learning where we realized it's actually it's the community that would have that would be, have the better signal to determine whether or not something should be deployed. So we switched to a model where communities could activate safety check. Um, and so, and then we also include. So then it became people were able to let people know they were okay. But then there was a request. Okay, so I can let people know that I'm okay. But then what about if I need something. Right. So then we, we started to figure, uh, putting together a suite of crisis response tools where people were organizations, um, development organizations, where um, rescue organizations could sort of say, these are, um, these are resources that are available to you in, in the area. And so all of those sort of re relied on data signals from the community, but there are data signals that the people, that people were able to offer themselves. So then it, so there was an, an, a, a, there to the point of people being able to actively participate in their own, in their own rescue by giving us those signals. Um, the, the second um, use case I would talk about is disaster maps. So traditionally, when you have moments of disaster, traditional forms of communication are often down. And so we said, is there an opportunity for us to sort of help and step in and provide data, particularly to development organizations that are trying to do work? Um, so there we work directly with humanitarian organizations and we asked them what types of data signals would be useful to you. And it's important to say that this, the, the data is de-identified, aggregated data. So it's not data that can be used to identify anybody, any specific person, but this data would allow us to partner with organizations to, for example, identify where help was needed. Um, so some examples of where it's been used is Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And Hurricanes Harvey, we worked directly with the American Red Cross um, to use the maps to inform disaster response so people could know this is where population is moving, this is where help is needed. Um, we partnered just recently in Kenya, there's mass flooding in Kenya where we partnered sort of on that. So those are some ideas, examples that we've done. And one last example is sure. in Nigeria, and this is not, this isn't interesting because it's not around a disaster, it's specifically mm. around disease. Yeah. So around meningitis, where we partnered with Nigeria CDC, so finding really forward-looking um, government organization to say, hey, they're interested in addressing epidemics and information, yeah. and so using signals on our platform when people are talking about it so that they could deploy resources and education to those areas. So those are some ideas. Th that's really examples. helpful, and I'm glad you got to the global health example as well. So one quick question for you. Um, you mentioned that some of this involves you know, data sharing partnerships, essentially, mm -hmm. and I know data privacy is at the center of those partnerships, but I'm just curious in terms of the way forward for Facebook. I know Facebook is... Um, rethinking every relationship it has, making sure that data privacy is at the center. 
And I've spoken with some NGOs that are concerned about the future of potential partnerships like the meningitis use case you mentioned. Um, so could you just give us some kind of preview or sense of what are Facebook's plans? How do you view partnerships as you find the way forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I started off by saying it's impossible for us to do this work without partnerships, right? right? So again, we're not experts. So this is something we can't do without. Um, I, I think, yes, it's fair to say that, that not just Facebook, but all companies are yeah. looking um, are looking more in depth at partnerships. But I would say that if we looked at partnerships across Africa, I mean, even the partnerships I talked about, we're all de we're dealing with aggregated, uh, de-identified data. So those we had already thought about data very. We've been very thoughtful. I'm sure that it it will have an impact in terms of we're going to be much we're going to be even more careful than we were previously about mm -hmm. partners that we about organizations we partner with yeah. I will say that across Africa we are very very interested in partnering with local organizations mm -hmm. so yes we value partnerships with sort of global organizations but we also recognize as a team in Africa that a lot of local organizations do a lot of the on the ground grunt work and mm -hmm. don't get a lot of um, what they don't get a lot of support and mm -hmm. so we are we're, again, we're interested in partnering broadly, but we are even more interested across Africa in partnering with locally run, um, locally led organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really helpful. I wanna bring Leisha into this conversation. And uh, Leisha, what I hope you'll talk with us about, I think many people here are probably familiar with uh, Last Mile Health and your work in Liberia and how it's expanding. Um, but can you tell us, what does data mean for your work? Not only in terms of what you're able to do, but sources of funding you're able to draw in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Catherine. It's a great question. So I think kind of first and foremost, one of the things that we frequently look at is how we can use data to promote equity. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we've seen so frequently with our work at Last Mile Health and sort of working with governments around health extension is how many data systems are actually designed for the average, not the outlier. Yeah. So, you know, I think much of our work sort of was founded in sort of initial work where we were actually seeing that in terms of investment, even if the investment was there, there mm -hmm. weren't actually the structures or the platforms available to be able to sort of push some of these services and then obviously the information that would come back with that out to, in our instance, highly remote communities. So, you know, sort of when working within, for example, a health system in which the average per capita investment is somewhere around $51 per person, um, but then we're actually seeing that in some of the areas where we have been sort of looking to deploy health workers, there's actually investment of around 72 cents. That's a big delta. Yeah. Um, so I think that much of what we have kind of focused on is something where with data systems, actually so frequently people jump immediately to technology, mm. but really understanding that you need to have from a position of sort of informatics, things mm. that foundationally make sense um, in terms of, in our instance, uh, how health systems are structured, what mm. policies are looking like, mm. how those programs are actually being rolled out, and then underpinning them actually how you can have interoperable data systems um, that are actually of utility. Mm -hmm. And I think in the Liberian uh, context, uh, the Liberian Ministry of Health and the government there has done an amazing job of actually developing and designing and deploying a community-based information system <laughs> is just one example that actually feeds into the national health management information system of the country. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more, if we're sort of looking towards a path of sort of equity, that actually also means equity and inclusion of specific areas of data that previously were outliers or were siloed or weren't actually integrated into the way that um, decision makers were actually using information to figure out who counts and who doesn't. That's really helpful. And I want to come back to some of this. I, I think some of the themes and, and really calls to action that you bring up are something to return to in the full group discussion if we have time. Uh, but I want to bring in Paul's perspective. And Paul, um, you know, I think a lot of people in this audience, just trying to put myself in your shoes, um, are looking at this when it comes to large scale implementation. What does data-driven decision-making look like? And I actually, uh, it's interesting because in preparing for this panel, I'm guilty of writing data-driven decision-making, data-driven decision-making. I had a conversation earlier today with um, one of our speakers from the plenary, and she was talking about it's mission-driven work, data-informed decision-making. And I thought that was really powerful. Mm -hmm. So I just want to hear in large-scale implementation, programs like Feed the Future, how do you stay mission-driven but data-informed? I think that's a great question. Thanks. I mean, when I think about the big, big data issues and, and its impact on development, People have been talking, or we in the development community have been talking for a number of years about it. 
Um, and in many ways, I think, as, as everyone knows, we've had advances in computational science, computing power, an explosion of available data, um, the ability to integrate data from disparate sources, and uh, advances in social science and behavioral economics. And all of that has really coalesced in a way that's allowed us to understand human behavior better and predict human behavior better. So it's opened up this great promise. And I think we all think, I have a colleague who would say, big data is like this giant, giant haystack and we all think there's a golden needle in it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the computational science is gonna help us find that needle really quickly. Um, and it doesn't really work that way because life is a lot more complex. I mean, the reality is there is no app for development, as you're saying. Right. Um, so if you think about what all of those advances in science, social sciences, because it's also social science, social science and, and computational science mean for development, it, it opens up a promise, but we're still kind of looking for a big win. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen on the ground with the neglected tropical disease program that we're doing that a lot of these technological advances has, have helped us map disease prevalence much more precisely, mm -hmm. which enables you to target the delivery of services better. As, as we've, see, we've seen trachoma eliminated in Laos and Cambodia, and as you get closer to elimination, kind of that last mile issue is it's really harder to get to. So the precision around um, kind of data is very, very helpful in that sense. Yeah. But how it applies more broadly gets into the complexities of development. And the reason I say there's mm -hmm. no app for development because development is about complexity. It's mm -hmm. about social and political and economic complexity. Mm -hmm. And if you want to drive decision making from data, you really have to delve into that complexity. I mean, the other, other way I like to think about it is um, evidence-based decision-making is not self-executing. Hmm. I mean, it's not, that's the case in the United States, right? Yeah. I mean, people who work in policy issues tend to think, if I do this study and it shows X, everyone who's a policymaker will understand the brilliance of that and immediately <laughs> change legislation. Right. So I think everyone knows that doesn't happen anywhere in the world. So how you drive policy making requires kind mm -hmm. of advocacy groups that can really understand the context, mm -hmm. understand who champions are, who blockers are, how to influence them, kind of getting beyond that. This, the second point I'll make on, on how you drive decision making mm -hmm. is about our col the colleagues on the panel have made the point about user participation, mm -hmm. being people centered. Um, it reminds me of the old Winston Churchill quote that you have to be careful not to use data like a drunk uses a lamppost, that is, for support rather than illumination. Um, so, and one way, I heard that one. <laughs> one way around that is involving people in data and collection, data analysis, and therefore mm. you drive better ownership of the data, less donorship of the data. Um, right. So in our programs, you mentioned Feed mm. the Future, we've got um, a Feed the Future program in Senegal where sometimes the technology does help. We've provided mm -hmm. GPS enabled devices to farmers that allow them to more precisely measure their plots. Mm -hmm. That has a huge impact. If you really understand your plots, you have a better chance of buying appropriate amounts of seed and fertilizer, which saves money, improves productivity, um, is better for the environment. You get a triple win around that. We have automated rain gauges that have, are connected to crop insurance that let um, the insurers understand when farmers have actually experienced losses, and that's pushed tens of thousands of farmers into crop insurance in Senegal, which is a big win. Um, and involving the farmers in collecting and analyzing the data gives them ownership mm -hmm. of it and helps them make decisions. Um, and we've seen big improvements in productivity, big improvements in production, and, and big imp in income, productivity, production, uh, and improvements across the board. Oh, and agricultural finance is what I'm struggling with. So, so I want to, <clears throat> I mean, I have several questions I, I want to ask you all, and I'm worried we just won't have the time to include them. So one of my big calls to action for all of you is to continue the conversation. We have a whole day here to continue the conversation on these topics, and I hope data will be at the center. But I actually also would like to go to the audience for a question. Um, and I, I heard that uh, we, we might have a perspective from someone who um, really brings a unique perspective here. This is Protik Basu. Um, so, Protik, I know you formerly worked in global health. You worked with Ray Chambers on efforts like ending malaria, which we talked about earlier. Um, and now you're, you're setting up a sustainable investment fund. And I think um, when we talk about what data can enable, part of it is enabling new business models, new investments. Uh, so really just curious to include your perspective here. What have we missed? What is your question for our panelists? Well, it's good to to be here, Catherine, and see some friendly faces on the, on the panel as well. 
so as you mentioned, yeah, for, for the past decade, managed rate chambers has worked on the international side. Now we're setting up a sustainable investing fund to achieve the SDGs with Paul Pullman and a few others. But one of the things that we're struggling with thinking through is this whole issue of impact measurement and monitoring. And I'd love to get the panel's view on this because there's a tension that we're starting to notice between um, rapid but perhaps imperfect mm -hmm. and less rapid and perhaps more accurate. Um, you come from the development world, you're used to UN surveys that are maybe great but two years out of date, mm. or you're used to more live things happening in the tech world these days. What's the right balance between the two? How do we start getting that right and mix those two data sources uh, together for decision making and feeding back to, for in the end now, my investors uh, who are seeking not to wait two years to get their results? Great question. And attention, I don't think we quite got to um, adequately yet. So who wants to jump in first? I think go. Sure. I, oh, please, go ahead, First, Toyin. <laughs> Toyin and Leisha. Together. <laughs> I'd like to actually see a combination of both. I like the fact that very rapid data allows us mm. to be able to act very quickly. If I look at my mammacare midwives mm. in a country where our referral system is not very good, mm. when one of the 200,000 midwives in just 22 months, which is what data enables us to reach, mm -hmm. was having quadruplets, I knew within two hours, and I could intervene mm -hmm. to get her a cesarean very quickly. But where the old slow method and the long reports work is that it actually does help us to be mm -hmm. able to map hotspots and to be able to draw out best practice. So for me, in an ideal world, the health worker would have very, very rapid data, which they're actually working with, but it would all go into what I would call um, an observatory, where the older style, uh, I don't want to say geeky, but you know, they can crunch through and begin to map the patterns for us. And I think we would have the best of both worlds if we could do both. Lisha, you want to jump in? Yeah, really good point. And I think, Protic, one of the things that I think you and your office have done such an excellent job in is really linking data with investment. Um, and I think one of the things that I think we frequently see when we're talking to investors is really their level of confidence required in the data that's being provided to them. So um, just a very specific example that I can think of is like giving investor confidence and giving programmatic or government confidence in the numerator and the denominator of mm -hmm. any particular activity, right? So, you know, if I'm actually hearing as, as someone working within government um, that immunization rates are 90% in my country, but I'm actually seeing constant and chronic measles outbreaks, maybe there's something that needs to be probed a little bit more deeply around there. So um, I think sort of building on Toyin's part, it's a little bit around um, uh, recognizing that technology is going to be able to make rapid delivery of data happen more quickly, but also applying a certain amount of critical eye to common sense around the, I think one of the speakers earlier today was talking about the story that the data tells. Mm, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that point up. And I know Paul wanted to jump in really quickly, then we'll have to wrap. Yeah, I think this is a vital question because this, this tension is critical. Funders, whether they're donors or investors, want some concrete evidence that we measure through metrics that their funding is being spent on something that makes a difference. But given the complexity of development, I think it's hard to get that right away and to wait for two years, as you said. And I think it really does require us to educate funders a lot more about, and I think DFID and USAID and the World Bank are moving in this direction, kind of a collaborative learning adaptation approach where you're constantly um, collecting data as you go and making adaptations and adjustments and not waiting two mm -hmm. years. And I, I know there's some other panel discussions on that, but we have to move from thinking that project design is a blueprint that we mm -hmm. follow like a construction yes. blueprint to something that's more like a template that we're adjusting over time. And Absolutely. we go, and the funders have to change their mentality around that. And that helps us set up uh, for <clears throat> some of our upcoming conversations. We're going to talk about not only monitoring and evaluation, but learning and adapting, uh, the critical next steps that are not always followed. But uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. Um, and thank you, Protic, for the wonderful question. Um, I'm going to let you all exit. Thank you. I do hope to continue the conversation with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Leisha. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> You're fine. Oh, thank you. I'll see you out there.